Good morning, everyone. Ready? Go to Ezekiel. I figure maybe for some of you it might take you a second because you're like, who? But I got a pretty good response in the Sunday school of those who have read Ezekiel, so I was thankful to hear that. Um, Ezekiel is my favorite. Probably, I know you're not supposed to really have favorites, and you probably, it seems weird to speak of a favorite of the Bible, but it's definitely one I really enjoy because it's just, you know, as we'll see, it's, it's quite uh, shocking and wonderful and full of wonder. But as you turn there, let me just, next, the, the hope is that next week we'll have like a little Q&A. The, the hope of that is for actually you guys to get to know us a little bit because it, it's weird having some just, some random person come in. I know you guys have had it for a while now, just preachers and teachers coming in and, and outside of Dave and other, you know, you don't know them. And it's really hard because really to be a pastor, you need to what? Know your people. And the people need to know the pastor, right? So I thought it best just for a chance to, for you guys, since I'll be here again next week, to get a chance to just get to know myself, my family. Obviously, uh, we have three missing. That's the, the challenge as you, you have adult children. They're all kind of dispersed all over the place. So, but I do have uh, Hudson, who's the oldest, here, and then Gabe, and then my uh, beautiful wife, Sarah, who's here with us. So I want to first get a drink. And then I want us to uh, go ahead. Everyone's found Ezekiel? Good. Very first. Start at the beginning. All right. So C.S. Lewis, in his sermon entitled The Weight of Glory, argues that all humanity is created with this ineradicable desire and longing to know and to be known by God. Lewis writes, Now, if we're made for heaven, the desire for our proper place will be already in us, but not yet attached to the true object, and will even appear as the rival of that object. What I think Lewis is saying is that we are created by God for God. We are made for heaven, to use his language. We're made to worship, to know, and to love God. The problem, as we know, is that due to our sinful rebellion, that attaching of ourselves to God. I love how he uses the language of attaching ourselves. We now attach ourselves, instead of to the true object of our desires, we pursue and chase after lesser gods, lesser things, rival objects. Instead of turning to the living and true God, we turn to false, counterfeit idols. We attach ourselves to lesser things who are rivals of the true God. And when we attach ourselves, when we give ourselves to lesser things, to lesser gods, that longing doesn't go away because that longing is not satisfied in those lesser things. It continues. In fact, it may even increase. And we start chasing after, you see it, your friends, your neighbors, your family, your wife, they're chasing after everything. And everything is failing and they keep chasing and keep chasing. Why? Because nothing in this world will satisfy. When we attach ourselves, we give ourselves to lesser things, we're haunted by that longing, that desire to know and be known for God, for those lesser things that will never satisfy. Lewis writes again, and listen to this because it's so good. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them, it only came through them, and what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only a scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. Only God will satisfy to know and be known by him, everything else, all lesser things, only offer us a faint scent, a quiet echo, distant news from a country far away. In other words, all of creation points to God and creates within us this deep longing for him. And it's only our inward sinfulness that turns us away from God to chase after lesser things. And those lesser things will always 
leave us wanting. But God in Christ has done something about that longing. He has created us for himself, and he reveals himself to us. He makes himself known so that we may be known by him, so that we may know him. He comes to his wayward people, bringing judgment and salvation. He comes in holy terror and unfathomable grace. We see this holy terror unfold in Ezekiel 1. Here in this remarkable vision of God, we encounter a God who makes himself known. A God who has made us for himself to know him and to be known by him. A God who reveals himself to a wayward people. To unfold this vision, I want to highlight four elements of the vision, and then I want to shift at the end to look at four implications that we should take away from this vision. So four elements of the vision that will break down the vision and then look at four implications from it. But I want to begin by reading it. Now, I don't know if you're used to reading longer passages of Scripture, but here's a little slightly longer one. So fasten your seatbelts and follow along with me. Ezekiel chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kibar Canal, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God on the fifth day of the fifth month. It was the fifth year of exile of King Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kibar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Verse 4. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their faces and each of them, um, their legs were straight, And their soles of their feet were like the sole of a cast foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Verse 8. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, The four had the face of an ox on the left, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wings of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures darted to and fro, like the appearance of a flash of lightning. And now, Ezekiel says, verse 15, As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheel and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of burl. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction, being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and their rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went. And the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And then verse 22, Over the heads of the living creatures was the likeness of an expanse, shining like all inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another, And each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, the sound of tumults, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And there came a voice, voice from above. The expanse over their heads, when they stood still, they let down their wings. 
And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne and the appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. And there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, as some of us may as well, after just listening to it, fall on our face. And we heard the voice of one speaking. If you're left a little... Out of breath as I am, you should be. We'll see, if if uh, you, you read through the book of Ezekiel later, you'll see that Ezekiel was actually wiped out for an entire week after receiving this vision. Exhausted, drained, taxed, spent. He saw the holy terror and, as we'll see also, the unfathomable grace of God. But let me... Work. Before we get to those four elements of the vision, let me just provide a little background. Briefly set the stage. We talked a little bit about the background in the Sunday school, but the year is 593 B.C. The people are in exile. It is probably the, the first deportation, if you will, the first exile of multiple exiles coming. They're there in exile. They've fallen under the judgment of God. They're captives in a foreign land, exiles in a faraway country. They know where they belong. They know their home. Those memories of that probably four-month journey 900 miles away are fresh. They feel the weight and sorrow. They've been there for five years, and the voice of God has been absent. Ripped away from their homes. Removed from all they've known, loved, and cherished. One author paints this striking picture. Listen to how this is described. She says, exile. It's not simply being homeless. Rather, it is knowing that you do have a home, but that your home has been taken over by your enemies. Exile, it's not being without roots. On the contrary, it is having deep roots, which have now been plucked up. And there you are, with roots dangling, writhing in pain, exposed to a cold and jeering world, longing to be restored to native and nurturing soil. Exile is knowing precisely where you belong, but knowing that you can't go back, at least not yet. They know precisely where they belong, and it's 900 miles away. They know precisely where God is supposed to be, and it is 900 miles away. They know loss, sadness, sorrow, tragedy. How much so? Psalm 137 says, By the waters of Babylon, They sat and wept. And when we remembered Zion, on the willows there we hung up our lyres. They couldn't sing anymore, for there our captives required of us songs. And our tormentors, Murrah, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How do you sing when everything you know and love is stripped away? You don't sing. You weep. Bitter tears for five long years. God's people, again as we'll see, receiving the just judgment for their sin, wept bitter tears. How in the world do you sing when you've been ripped away from everything that you know, ripped away from the very source of your own God who's supposed to protect you? But God has not abandoned his people. This is the the mystery and wonder of Ezekiel 1. There by the Kibar Canal, Canal, hundreds of miles away, Ezekiel, a priest, is with them. It is 593 B.C. The heavens are opened. They're not supposed to open there. Visions of God are not supposed to come there. They're supposed to come in Jerusalem and the holy city, Zion. And here, so very far away from their home. 
so very far away from the God they worship. God himself comes to them. He comes to the prophet Ezekiel with visions for his people. There are four elements of these visions. I'm going to look at them just in turn. The first one is the living creatures. These four living creatures are present throughout the entire vision. They have this human likeness. They have four faces, four wings. So they're human-like, but yet not human-like. Like, we can kind of get it, but we kind of can't get it, right? Like, I mean, imagine, like, you could get this face, um, but, like, to have an eagle behind it, it just doesn't work. Then they, they have two wings, and they fly with the two wings, and the other two wings are covering their bodies. And this is a somewhat of a side note, but notice, as I've read it, notice the movement in the psalm. Movement, move. The psalm is moving. It's active. Think about, contrast this with Isaiah 6, which is another similar vision, similar to this. It's static. It's a throne room. The cherubim are there. They're there. But this is moving. There's movement. The, the angels are moving. Their wings are flapping so loud it sounds like an army. There's flashes of lightning. There's sound. There's movement. There's terror. There's dread. God is on the move. He is coming from the holy city where he's dwelt to his people now in exile. There's a bustle, a busyness, a constant activity. The living creature is constantly moving. And here I think, as many commentators see, God is coming. Here's the thing, right? We've mentioned this in Sunday school. Often we think of God's presence as a good thing. But not so here. God is coming as a divine warrior. His people are in exile because of their sin. They're there for a reason. And now, the presence of God as a divine warrior. I mean, just look at the imagery. Fire and burning and sound as if an army is marching. And then there's the second element of the vision. There's wheels, these constant wheels. Now, we, you're probably familiar with Isaiah 6, right? So you get that vision. So you get the, the cherubim, which later in Ezekiel, it describes the, these living creatures as the cherubim. You get that, right? But wheels? That's a new one, right? And then there's wheels... And then there's wheels intersecting with wheels. And then to top it off, there's eyes on the wheels inside the wheels. And you're left wondering what in the world is going on. And you know what? What are you smoking? <laughs> yeah. I think you might have to be smoking to understand this. There was this uh, little tangent. There was this, uh, we were just in Colorado recently. What was the name of that event? That place we visited, that was so crazy. You're, gonna, you're blanking on it, so it's not. There's a, there's this, it's a place, it's like, I think there's one in Philly similar to it. Me Meow Wolf. Has anyone heard of Meow Wolf? It is like the most psychedelic, trippy, crazy thing. So it's fascinating, though. So it's this whole big warehouse, and there's all these creative, weird art installations. And again, this is in Colorado, so I feel like if you're high, most of Colorado, you'd probably get it more. But the great thing is, it's wrapped around this story. There's these, there's these earths collided, these like, kind of like this multiverse thing. All these different parts of earth collided, and, and there's four women went missing. And it's a whole mystery. And as you go and visit each thing, you're scanning this card, and you're unfolding more and more. The mystery is fascinating. But, and it, but you, you left being like, what? You, you, I mean, there's a, co a coherent story through it, but you're still left confused. And I, I, but, but there was also a, a, a wonder and a joy in it. Like, that was, it was amazing. Like, I, we had a really good time, but uh, we're still, like, scratching our heads. What's going on here? And I think that's kind of what Ezekiel does for us. It leaves us scratching our heads, but that's a good thing. We should be a little confused, a little confounded. We should be left at wonder when we're confronted with God. Yes, the God who makes himself known. We'll talk about that more. But here, the wheels within the wheels. A lot of people see this keeping with the theme of judgment as a chariot. That's a possible explanation, even though it's obviously not like the traditional chariot. But if God is coming as a divine warrior to judge his people, what would he come riding in to keep with the traditional image? See, for us, all this imagery is far removed. For Ezekiel, it was common imagery. This was stuff that he would have seen. He would, he would have seen chariots. He would know of war, war that is coming. A wind comes out of the north. Where did most of Israel's enemies come from? The north. And here is God coming from the same place. Why? Because God at this point is 
Israel's enemy because they rejected him. He comes as a divine warrior to judge his people. The third element, briefly, is that there's this vast expanse. Towering above the living creatures and the wheels is a separation. All things created, separated from their creator. Look at verse 24. And when they went, the living creatures, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, the sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. God is going to war against his people. He's coming and bringing judgment with him. And then there's a picture of a throne. The fourth element. I want to see two things about this vision of the throne. The first one is the one who is on the throne. I personally believe this is none other than the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we would call a theophany. This is Jesus Christ in splendor and glory before he takes upon himself humanity. And listen to the picture of Christ. The one seated on the throne, Ezekiel 27 says, a likeness with a human appearance. It's a vision that Ezekiel could begin to wrap his head around. Again, he's a human, well, at least at one level, but then he's a human encased and wrapped in fire and gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. These images of gleaming metal and blazing fire show how profound, blistering, and blinding the radiance of Jesus Christ is. He is surrounded in fire, brightness all around. And the second part that could easily be missed, and this is where I think the element of grace is mixed with judgment. Look at verse 28. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Surrounding the inflamed, radiant Lord Jesus Christ is a rainbow. A rainbow. What does the rainbow mean? God judges, but God saves. The rainbow put in the sky by God himself after he judged the earth is a declaration that I shall never judge that harshly again. And it's a promise that I will one day save my people. And here, at the very moment of terror and horror and dread, as Ezekiel sees this vision of the pre-incarnate Christ, there's a promise of grace, a promise of salvation, a promise of mercy. God's covenant love, I will save. The rebellious hearts of his people drove them into exile. They broke a covenant with God, but God comes to these covenant breakers with the radical vision of a Savior surrounded by the symbol of His deep, merciful covenant love. A rainbow. This vision of Christ, a divine warrior, coming to judge His peace, people, but also coming to bring mercy. Coming to bring grace. And there at that moment, Ezekiel, having not heard the people of God in exile, having not heard from God there, received this terrifying vision of God. And then comes the throne, the Savior, the Redeemer and Judge, but the one who has a bow. And if you know, the bow is not just a rainbow. It's a weapon of war. It brings judgment, but it also brings salvation. And there is Jesus Christ bringing that judgment and that salvation. And the entire book of Ezekiel unfolds under those two themes of judgment and salvation. So, if there's a divine warrior coming to bring salvation and judgment to his people, what are some four implications we can take away from this? First and foundationally, God has made himself known. He's revealed himself. We would not know God if it were not for his own self-revelation. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Before there was Jesus, meaning before the Word became flesh, there were visions of God, there was still Jesus. 
Ezekiel receives one of those visions. Ezekiel tells us that he's there by the Kibar Canal. The heavens were opened, and he saw visions of God. All that unfolds in this chapter is a vision of God. A vision of a divine warrior coming to bring judgment and salvation to his wayward people. Even in the vision, even in God revealing himself, he remains clouded in mystery. God still, though, has made himself known. We would do well to consider what God is seeking to tell us through this vision. He doesn't reveal himself to obscure himself. He doesn't reveal himself to hide himself, not entirely at least. He reveals himself to be known. This chapter, which we just read, that should have left us all kind of scratching our heads, is God's revelation to make himself known. So then we ask, what does he want us to know about him? Judgment and salvation. Mercy and grace. The second thing that's part of this revelation is that God remains mysteriously incomprehensible. Yes, God has made himself known. He remains clouded in wonder and awe. Think about it. Ezekiel chapter 1, it's a revelation of God. You think of revelation being what? Clear. Is Revelation chapter 1 clear? Not really. Is that a bad thing? No. It's a good thing. We should be a little bit confounded by our God. The moment we figure out God is the moment he what? Ceases to be God. There's that creator-creature distinction. The moment that is eradicated and we got God figured out is the moment he's no longer God, and, and maybe we are. God is God. So far above us. Theologians talk about his transcendence. God is so far removed from us. And this vision is clear on that, right? God, wheels upon wheels, angels expands this fiery human engulfed in a rainbow fire? That's transcendence. But what's present? God is present with his people. He is imminent. He is there by the very river in a foreign land with this wayward, rebellious, sinful, wicked people. God is present, imminent, transcendent. He remains, even in his imminence, his closeness, his proximity, his presence, profoundly, wholly different other. This vision of God is a splendor, a glory, and there's a weight to the glory. You've heard of that phrase. The very term in Hebrew implies it. A depth, a cost, a weight, a heaviness. It's an unbearableness. Glory is too much for us. No one could see God and live. Moses, at his best, is given a backside glimpse of God, and he is transformed forever. God is holy. The mystery of the unknown God works in us, leaving us longing to know him more should lead us to awe and reverence and humility. Why? Because he is God. Unknowable, incomprehensible, yet very knowable. Doesn't seem to make sense, right? Allow that tension to exist. Allow a little paradox. Keep a little mystery. Because the moment you remove mystery is the moment you lose wonder. And God is to be wondered at. Ezekiel 1 is not so much to be understood as much as to fall down in front of. That's what Ezekiel does. He is actually wiped out. If you go back and you'll see, he is completely wiped out from this vision of God. Third thing, implication, which I already alluded to, is that he's present with his people. Now, as believers, we, we often view God's presence positively. It's a thing of grace and mercy. It's something we want. We want, you know, God, we, we sing, God, please be with us in our worship. And Jesus promises to be with us always to the very end of the age. But here, in this moment, God's presence brings terror. It brings judgment. The wages of sin is death, and sin demands a sacrifice. It demands death. The terrifying presence of God comes reminding his people of those demands. How does Ezekiel respond to this vision? Look at verse 28. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord 
when I saw it, I fell on my face. I don't think, I, I do think this is an act of worship. But I think it's more than that. I think he is so confounded, so overwhelmed, so joyed and heartbroken and terrified and wondered at the same time all of those if you ever had the experience with all of your emotions are so turned into the blender mixed up and you're just emotionally drained the only thing you can do is go back home and fall on the bed here is Ezekiel having been confronted by this vision of God and he fall I do think he's worshiping but I think he at this point he is nothing left he falls flat on his face worshipfully but also terrified. Terrified. Because God is present. The very thing Ezekiel never expected. They were there five long years away from their home. The last thing Ezekiel was expecting was God to show up. He'd probably given up on God at this point, if we're honest. I know five years, 900 miles away from home, kicked out, yeah, God, yeah, okay, all your word, none of it's proven true. You didn't protect your people. I mean, what they failed to see is their sin led them there. But I can guarantee you there were some faithful men and women of God who also were caught up in it. We know that from Daniel, right, and others. God, where are you? You've heard that echoed before by others, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? I am pretty certain those words were on the lips of Ezekiel. And then all of a sudden, God comes in terror and wonder and glory and power. And it leaves Ezekiel flat on his face. Maybe. (laughs) Now, those of us reading this who have believed and trusted in Jesus Christ have the declaration above us, there is no condemnation. So we no longer have the fear of God wiping us out, per se, that doesn't mean we should not have the fear. I remember one time in college, we tend to, to trivialize and, and make light of God. I remember one time in college, this, this woman stood up, and she said, just talk, she was talking about how she just recently broke up with her boyfriend, but she was so thankful because God was her boyfriend. And, but before you, but, but think, of, yeah, yes, it's wrong. Like, it minimizes God, but at the same time, it's saying something very true of God. That he is a constant help in trouble. So she, she, at the, she, at the risk of getting something right about God, she also got something wrong about God. But let's be, I mean, we laughed at it. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what college did I start going to? Uh, it was a Bible college, by the way. It was a good, solid overall. But, um, but we all do that, right? We all twist God's truth. And I think, especially those who think they have it right, or more so, probably are, are, are in greater danger because we think we have it right and we don't see where we potentially get wrong. What is... What is the one central part of Ezekiel's vision when he's down flat on his face? If there's one word to convey that, it is this. Humility. And that's where every follower of Christ should be. Every follower of Christ. Confronted by the living God. Sure, we can debate theology. We can discuss things. We can disagree. But at the end of the day... With that brother or sister we disagree with, where should we be? Flat on our face. Because one day, guess what? We will be possibly even right next to that brother or sister whom we disagree with, flat on our face before the living God. Forever and ever. Fourth, God's people who know and are known by him are meant to make him known. God's people who are known by God, who know God, are to make Him known. Meaning, what God has shown to us is not meant for us just to keep. We are meant to be those who proclaim His knowledge, proclaim His message. We are to make God known. The entire book of Ezekiel, if you read through it, has this one phrase, Know that I am the Lord. And that comes from both salvation of the Lord and judgment of the Lord. People know God through His saving mercies and through His just judgments. But they're also supposed to know God through our words and through our lives, through what we do and through what we say. 
So what is that message? I think the message that we have is very similar to the message of Ezekiel. What have I said? It's salvation and judgment. You all know John 3.16? What about John 3.17? Listen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We love that part. Verse 17, but we always stop there. Why do we always stop there? Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Salvation. Judgment. Just like Ezekiel. There's a continuity of message between, surprise, right? <laughs> between the God's message of the Old Testament and the God's message in the New Testament. Judgment remains. Jesus didn't come in the world to condemn the world. Their condemnation was already there. He comes as a light to take those who are already condemned and to rescue them. So the good news that we must proclaim is that the light has come into the world. This light exposes sin, exposes evil, but in doing so also holds out the hope of forgiveness, the glory of redemption. The message we proclaim is Jesus as the light of the world. Ezekiel, clothed in fire, wrapped in a rainbow. If you want a picture of the light of the world, there it is. The divine warrior, Jesus, in Ezekiel and in John 3, strikes fear into the hearts of those who reject him, but extends grace, mercy, and forgiveness to all who believe, to all who are bought by his precious blood. See, the good news of Ezekiel is that God has made himself known. He reveals himself to us as a divine warrior, bringing judgment and salvation But all who believe and place their faith and trust in this divine warrior, in the Lord Jesus Christ, will receive life forevermore. That is the promise of the good news. And this eternal life begins in the here and now, where, going back to Lewis, our longings and our desires of our hearts find the right attachment, find the right place where they should be. We find our center in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the one, the divine figure, he was flaming in rainbow, in the one who suffered and died upon a cruel, wretched cross, bruised, bloodied, and naked for our wayward, sinful rebellion. The sum and substance of that good news is Jesus Christ, the divine warrior whose bow of covenant mercy stands ready to save, to save all who believe and trust in him. Father, it was your love. You so loved the world that you sent your one and only Son. And Jesus, you came to die. You, the warrior king, came to rage battle in humility upon a wretched cross. And you bled and died and then rose again for our justification, for our salvation. And Spirit of God, you are with us always, always moving, always active, even as we see in Ezekiel 1, always present. Help us to know the depths and riches of your covenant love. Help us to read chapters like Ezekiel 1 and be left in awe. Because this is the God who loves us. This is the God who so loved the world that he came and died and rose again. This is the God. Help us to see this God, to worship you, our God, to be your people. We thank you for your Son, and it's in his great name we pray. Amen.